Hello denizens of YouTube. For the most part, 2015 was a pretty solid year for gaming as a whole. Hey, I said for the most part. Anyway, 2015 was a pretty solid gaming year for me as well, and I'm here to share my favorite games that I played during last year. Just to be clear, these games didn't necessarily have to be released in 2015, I just had to play them for the first time. I am also ruling out any remasters and new editions of games that I played the original version of. So no Devil May Cry 4 Special Edition, and no DMC Definitive Edition, as much as I loved both of those. Well, let's get started and dive into my favorite games of last year. The Unfinished Swan is a stellar first-person adventure game that presents itself like that of a storybook. The game follows the story of Monroe, an orphan boy who has found himself lost in one of his deceased mother's paintings, The Unfinished Swan. Each chapter of the game introduces a new gameplay element to avoid being too repetitive, my favorite being throwing paintballs at the white canvas around you to reveal the true environment. Along with just progressing through the world that the game presents to you, you can look for collectibles such as balloons or these pieces of a story of a, the life of a king. Each of these spread throughout all the chapters. This game is short and sweet, it doesn't overstay its welcome at all. The easy difficulty matched with the storybook presentation makes for a pretty relaxing experience. I am not a particularly huge fan of sports games. I am also not a big fan of driving games. That being said, Rocket League's concept drew me right in. Playing soccer while controlling a turbo-powered car is so cool. Rocket League is a lot of fun. It controls really well and is easy to play. The games are fast-paced and exciting, and the turbo and jump functions can be combined to perform awesome tricks, or you can crash into the opposing team for a demolition, and it is so satisfying. There are plenty of neat unlockables to get to, ranging from new cars, paint jobs, and turbo trails. The only minor gripe I have with this game is that teammate AI is kind of bad. The amount of times I've been scored on by my own team is something I do not wish to disclose. Overall, Rocket League is an exhilarating game that kept me coming back for one more game a dozen times over. The latest addition to the Smash Bros. series has been a blast for me to play throughout the last year. The roster is absolutely massive and has some great new characters. My favorites being Little Mac and Rob. In addition to the new characters, some of the veteran fighters have also received some reworking to their movesets, such as Bowser's Dropkick and Link's Run and Smash. This new installment had also added 8-player Smash for chaotic matches never seen in the series before. The single-player modes, such as Classic and All-Star, also return, although I wish there was some sort of adventure mode, not necessarily something as intricate and story-driven as Subspace Emissary, but a mode similar to Melee's adventure mode would have been special order and customization modes are also available. This game also just keeps on giving with its DLC characters such as Ryu and Roy, Cloud even joined the party, and soon Bayonetta. Overall, I'd say that this game is absolutely smashing. In a genre so seemingly stagnant as that of the competitive shooter genre, Splatoon is a breath of fresh air. Splatoon is full of frantic shooting action and plenty of personnel. Spreading ink across the various maps that the game has to offer provides a quick way to move around the arena. The controls are responsive and easy to learn, the matches are fast-paced and only about 5 minutes, so no one game will drag on for too long. There's a nice variety of weapons to choose from, ranging from machine gun type ink blasters to paint rollers and even a gap. Each weapon comes with a sub-weapon and special move to accompany it. Multiplayer offers plenty of different ways to play, such as Turf War, which is a simple mode of which team can cover more of the arena with their killer, Splat Zones, which is a type of domination mode, Rainmaker, which is a mode akin to that of Capture the Flag. My favorite is Tower Control, due to how dynamic it can be. One minute a team can be losing, and the very next they can be on the verge of victory. Splatoon also offers a single-player mode, which operates more like a platformer than a shooter. It's fun, but most of my time has been spent playing online. Platoon is a fun and colorful new game that is sure to remain fun and addictive for a long time. Journey is right up there with Shadow of the Colossus as one of the most thematic and atmospheric games I've ever played. I can't exactly pinpoint what makes this game so great, but as a whole it's an absolutely splendid experience. You start the game as this rogue traveler placed in this beautiful desert landscape. 
you're being beckoned by a light at the top of this far off mountain. The environments, the music, the presentation, they all come together to deliver an absolutely superb experience. The ultimate goal is presented to you from the very start, and the point of the game is what you make with the couple of hours that you spend trying to achieve that goal. The game packs a lot of memorable moments into just two to three hours of gameplay. The sand surfing part is a moment of gaming that will not be forgetting anytime soon. It encapsulates the best of the visuals, the music, and the atmosphere. The game also implements a multiplayer function that enriches the experience. No usernames, heck, you may even mistake it as part of the game's scripting, but it is still nice to see that there is a companion traveling with you as you make this journey. Overall, Journey is an excellent experience from beginning to end that I would wholeheartedly recommend. Sometimes I don't realize how much I like something until right when I finish it. It happened when I watched the Tales of the Abyss anime, and it happened as I finished Transistor. Transistor is a top-down isometric RPG set in the engrossing cyberpunk world of Cloudback. The game throws you right into the middle of the action as the main character, Red, plucks the titular Transistor from the front's dead body. From then on, bits and pieces of the plot are revealed little by little, and they all interweave into a rather interesting story. The combat in Transistor is an interesting style of gameplay. It either lets you play in real time or use the turn function, which stops time and lets you plan out the attack. The only drawback is that most of your functions won't work until the turn you is fully restored. The Transistor has a whole slew of different abilities available to it. The cool thing is that each function can be used in different ways. Either as a direct action, which are most of your attacks, a modifier for another function, or a passive ability. The game also encourages you to experiment by letting you change up your functions at each save point that you find throughout the game, and revealing more lore each time you use one of your functions differently. Transistor's soundtrack is one of my favorites. Vocal tracks are well sung, my favorite being Paper Boats, and the songs such as Old Friends do a good job working with the environments to bring the cyber noir vibe to life. Transistor is a game that I've replayed a few times by now, and I'm probably going to play it again sometime soon. I'm still unsure as to whether or not I like Dragon Age Inquisition more than Dragon Age Origins, but that's a video for a different day. Dragon Age Inquisition, however, does stomp on any of the doubts I would have had after playing Dragon Age 2. The game takes some of the follies of Dragon Age 2 and corrects them, as well as improving some of the elements that Origins brought to the table. The conflict of Inquisition is bigger than just a conflict focused on one city, this time the fate of two kingdoms are at stake. Something from Origins that Inquisition improved on is actually feeling like you're commanding an army, in Origins, you were running around saving cats from trees and helping people find their lost siblings, all in the sake of recruiting them to your cause, but it never actually felt like you were in command of that. Inquisition does well to correct that. Combat is more like Dragon Age 2, although it feels better paced. You can use the tactical camera to play the game in a way similar to that of the PC version of Origins, if you want. One of the best highlights of the combat mechanics in this game are the dragon battles. They feel like a huge step up the battles in the other two. The world in Dragon Age Inquisition is absolutely there are so many quests to do, lore to gather, collectibles to collect, all of it with the purpose of gathering more influence and resources for the position. Characters in this game are pretty solid, my favorite being Varric, returning from Dragon Age 2, Iron Bull, Sarah, and Dory. One gripe I do have with the game, however, is that most of the areas don't really have much of a point to them besides just gathering new things about. Origins had each area with a major problem for the party to solve, and a self-contained self-plot while still reminding me of the main threat. In areas such as the Emerald Graves or the Hissing Waste, it felt like the only reason I was there was because the enemy faction was there. Although when the plot does pick up, it gets really good. I just wish there was more of that. Overall, Dragon Age Inquisition is a great game that has me interested to see what the series does going forward. This game does everything a good sequel should do. It builds up on what made the first game great, while adding in original parts of its own. The puzzles are even more creative than the first games. Additions such as light bridges, speed gel, bouncy gel, and reflective cubes make for great new additions to the puzzle solving goodness. All of the puzzle solutions make sense and there were none that seemed like they were impossible to solve. The aha moment I got every time I solved the puzzle was awesome. The humor is excellent in this game as well. The additions of new characters such as Wheatley do nothing but add fun. 
Cave Johnson is absolutely hilarious. Ha! I like your style. You make up your own rules, just like me. Bean Counter said I couldn't fire a man just for being in a wheelchair. Did it anyway. Ramps are expensive. Portal 2 also has some pretty solid level design. At first it might just seem like Portal with a new coat of paint, but after a few chapters you begin to explore new areas of the enriching design. Portal 2 also has more story to dive into, which is great because it's just another outlet for more humor to come kind of spewing out of. Gladys gets further fleshed out, and Wheatley also gets his fair share of development. And as I said before, while his role is minor, Dave Johnson is hilarious. Demand to see life's manager! Make life rue the day it thought it could give Cave Johnson lemons! Do you know who I am? I'm the man who's gonna burn your house down with the lemons! I'm gonna get my engineers to invent a combustible lemon that burns your house down! <laughs> all in all, Portal's memorable characters, witty humor, and general creativity make it a blast to play from start to finish. You know, when I was younger, I used to be one of those people who had an irrational hatred for this game because of its art style. Boy, am I glad I got over that because this game is incredible. The first thing I'm going to say is how I was straight up wrong about the art style to begin with. The cell shading cartoonish style looks great and it adds a lot of expression to the world. The graphics have also aged pretty well too. Stunning graphics aside, I would place this game right up there with Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask as far as the Zelda series goes. I found the sailing to be enjoyable, especially after I got the speed sail. I found myself exploring all the small islands that I came across. If it seemed like there was an island that I would have to have a specific item for, I was excited to eventually get that item and go back and see what prize awaited. There were some neat bits of gameplay as well, such as being able to pick up enemy weapons and use them against them, having cool context-sensitive commands during combat. The dungeons were all pretty easy, but I didn't find that to be much of an issue. I found them all to be pretty engaging. They even managed to avoid a sucky water-based dungeon in this game. The characters in this game are all pretty enjoyable. Well, except for Tinder. Zelda and Tetra are both pretty entertaining. The King of Red Lions is one of my favorite companions that the series has. Heck, they managed to even paint Ganondorf in a slightly sympathetic light. This game is full of memorable moments, my favorite being an area that you get to about midway through the game. The amount of atmosphere in that part is crazy awesome. Wind Waker is definitely a game that I had fun with crewing through. It's on par with some of my other favorite Zelda games, and I'm glad I finally got to try it. Kojima's final entry into the Metal Gear franchise has become very polarizing. Some people are not a fan of its open world nature and see the cut content as a major detriment. I still manage to enjoy this game quite a bit. I happen to like it just as much as MGS 1, 2, 3, and 4. I poured hours upon hours into this game, whether it was progressing with story missions, doing side ops, or I was having a good time no matter what I was doing. The game gives you plenty of freedom and options to tackle your infiltrations in whatever manner you see fit. When you want to go in guns blazing, you can. If you want to tranquilize and strap balloons to everyone and everything you can. Or you can even rocket punch enemy soldiers into submission if you want. My favorite tactic was holding guards up, interrogating them, and then strapping balloons to them. It was a good way to save ammo and recruit people all at once. One major complaint against this game is how sparse the story is. Which is true, it isn't what most fans of the franchise are used to in terms of how much there is. But I do think it's well done when it picks up. I also want to point out that the cinematography in this game is excellent. I love the long, continuous, sweeping shots during some of the more exciting scenes. I'm also okay with Keeper Sutherland's performance as Snake. There's one scene in particular that made me feel that this was a pretty solid rendition. The only major complaint I have really is that Skullface turned out to be less impressive than I thought it would be. Going into this game, he was the character I was most intrigued in, actually. Once it was all said and done, I found myself disappointed with his role. I enjoyed the other characters, though. Kai's wanting to turn absolutely everything into a roaring rampage of revenge was interesting to see develop. Quiet also had an interesting arc from start to finish. So despite this game having some cut content and being a departure from the series by being open world, I still love this game. When I play an MGS game and think about what I'm looking for, on, I think of all the great memories that the other games have provided me with. And if this final installment delivered, it provided me with plenty of memories that I won't be forgetting for a very long time. 